the things that we're going to talk about the next sort of 20 minutes have just been along that journey and, um, and the things I've observed. The, the pictures will just, they look like they're diagrams and pictures, but it's the most important part is the people bit of how the people use the pictures um, to understand the problems and to make changes. I thought I'd try and get your, your attention first. And, and you know, th these, are, these are kind of numbers, and the, the speakers after me will, will talk more and more about the detailed aspects of these things. But I thought, these, these are now the kind of changes that I actually believe can be achieved. John has already talked about almost like all oh, the component level part of all of these things, so I don't have to talk about an A3. A scientific method is needed for anything. The currency that you're solving changes dep depending on your focus. What I normally find when I go to places within health is usually they're really, really good at filling in the right-hand side because we employ lots of solutions people. The left-hand side is blank. But actually, when we come to implement the solutions, we really struggle. Okay, and, and it's only after going around that loop once or twice that you actually try and drag people to the left-hand side of the page. So all of the things I talk will just build up that method. As I go around the place, as we talk about this, I, um, it's often viewed as two piles of work. There's the day job looking after patients and the improvement. And they, 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 they're conflicting. So what we actually said was, actually, if, if we could actually make this the day job, which actually is the, is the main point of this, we could get resources, we, we should be able to compress timelines, um, and things should move quicker. So what we thought we'd do is we'd actually try and find out what the big problems gener uh, generally hospitals are facing and go after one. But rather than traditionally create this as a program of work and set five teams off in parallel working on it, we actually thought, was there one underlying problem there was actually causal to the others? And this was our first kind of analysis, dive, sort, call it what you like. But what we actually worked out is if, is if we could go after emergency medical type problems, we believed that we would actually have a positive impact on the others. And at this point, it was a bet. It was a hypothesis. So we got the teams working through this. And you stick it in. Now, I must say, at this point, we're really, really trying to engage the senior leadership of the organization in these approaches to come out, try and see what's really going on, participate for themselves, and participate all the way through the process. We really don't want them just dipping in and out and acting as um, reviewers and cheerleaders for the teams. Although they're, they're valid roles. So the idea is, is what problems are of interest to these senior people? Because, you know, day job, aren't they trying to solve those problems most of the time that they're actually in work? key currency, the purpose, is patience. Okay? Um, and you think that would kind of be easy for people in health to really keep the patient number one at the forefront of their mind. But when we go through this, the patient in the front normally lasts about 10 to 15 minutes, and then what actually happens is the people go back into their expertise, their technical area of comfort. Okay? And what you find is, is it's like they have to keep being dragged, sometimes literally, to the patient perspective, because we kind of lose it. We, we kind of get defocused. So to go after length of stay, medical emergency demand, you've got to delve in. And as you delve in, you actually find the components of that demand. So you're looking at patients, where they come in, what they come in with, what problems do they have, where they go. And that's the kind of idea, the rest is just that grouping. So, and then you're actually talking about volumes and things that are actually moving through your organization. And that's a simple diagram on the right. You can see the, the shortness of breath presenting problems was a, was a common one. And actually, by following that, you could see that uh, the steps were pretty much the same for the other patients. 
So what we're trying to say is, you know, we don't have to follow everybody here. We'll pick a sample, go after it, and see if it's representative. That is still not enough of an understanding to get at what's really causing the big problems. We have to go further and further into this um, patient perspective. So what we do is we actually go out and we follow patients. And this part here, the bottom part, the spine, is, is, is made up of two, two, types of, uh, two types of icons, okay? The boxes are where our staff are with the patients. So that's good. Oh, oh, that's good. The triangles are where the patient is on his own waiting for something. Okay? And if you notice, every box, there's a triangle. Box, triangle, box, triangle, box, triangle. And what we actually found was if we picked one patient and followed that one patient, that activity took so long that we couldn't really do it. So we had to kind of, kind of come up with a hybrid system where we took benches of patients. But that's the main thing, where they come from, where they go to, their perspective. As soon as you've got that, the real part then that you start to drill down, and this is where we actually find the level of data that, and, uh, and the facts you actually have about your operations. Um, but for each one of those now, we actually get the team to go and record these things. PA is, is planned and actual. It's like for that step, for that patient, do they actually have a plan? Where is it? What, what, what are we actually trying to give them? And then did they actually get it? Usually, once you've been through a few of these things and you're set up, because the, another thing we found is until we set up these measuring systems, you can't tell how you were doing beforehand. But usually, when you, when you look at these things in, a, in an acute unit, we don't usually plan anything to happen for patients for half the time they're in the hospital. So there is actually no, no plan service for them, let alone then do we actually deliver it. So we got, this is the plan, do they get it? The actual availability of that service, the access of that service, the capacity part is about the people. Okay, so the people are the people are the currency that can actually move the patient on. Capacity just thought of in terms of spaces is, is an incomplete definition. The capacity in terms of a space to put someone as a hold, as a buffer, is part, but the actual the value add, the change part is usually done by individuals. So that's a real key if you like, a real key point for this. And the last part at the bottom is how often these, these interventions, these scheduled activities actually happen. As we go through it, and we did look at these people aspects as we went all along those things, we, we, we actually never found one service group who was at 100% of, the, of their budgeted capacity. So once we looked at the patient's journey, we then look at what are the offline things that their patients are actually trying to get. And we link those in then to the patient. So now this is where we start actually looking from a patient's perspective to actually our staff's perspective, trying to give the, trying to give the patient their planned treatment. At that point, you start asking questions like, well, how does anybody kind of know to do the next step, how do you order services, how do things happen? And this is where you start to actually get into what are the information triggers and systems and movements that actually make this place run. And that's kind of quite scary at, at, at this point. Um, so you start putting the, the layers of the notes, the templates, the handwritten forms, the faxes, the bleeps, the phone calls, the electronic systems, the workarounds. You then, after all of that, because that doesn't quite work, you then put on there the armies of the bed managers, the expediters, the flow coordinators, the, all the other people who are actually trying to intervene and do something about those triangles that are waiting through the system. And actually, when you roll it all up, the triangles are worth about 90% of your length of stay. 
So really, at that point, we said, well, so, you know, let's, let's stop trying to squeeze the boxes, which are only 10% of your length of stay, and actually your staff are there doing the good stuff with the patient. Let's stop increasing the, st the stress for staff. Let's go and have to, let's find the root causes of the triangles as a starting point. As a senior group, that's kind of like your, your responsibility, and wouldn't that be great for your staff to see you doing that? That's, that's an actual one. It's hand-drawn, and the, the people are actually out doing this for themselves. We, you know, we don't do it for them, we, we help. And it's a bit of theatre when it's presented like this. The, the real value is in the group of people, the senior people, the medical directors, the, the senior clinicians, the people who drew it. It's the act of drawing it and being where these things are done, that learning is the key bit. Just rolling out the map occasionally and producing it and, and do things. That's not really what it's about. That's, that's not the purpose of it, although it is useful. So when we get to that stage and we follow the science and we're delving in, we're trying to find those triangles, up until that point, that's when it's unleashed and we sort of get to the brainstorming phase. But what we're, what we're trying to say to people is, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, you know, be, be, before we get to that, let's, let's just try and find out why it's happening first. Because we're, we're, as observing this in the past, not, not this particular one, but we've actually come up, I've seen brainstorm lists of things that we could do in the hundreds. That, that's not possibly, you can't action that. And you certainly can't action it in a, in a cost-effective manner. So we said, hang on, let's just keep the science going here. So if you notice now, we've kind of quantified our current, but what it's actually opened people's eyes to is actually we don't know enough, we have to go further. And actually, if you think about that, that map you saw there of a shortness of breath patient coming in, being admitted onto a ward, leaving to go home, which was most of the demand. Normally, the, you know, the units we were talking about there, the medical take every day was about 70 patients. So actually, you've got 70 of those all trying to get through at any one time, plus all the people already in the system. This next part is where we start to go with people are saying, right, now with this understanding, let's bet, let's hypothesize, if you like, what are we trying to achieve? Let's actually define a goal that's measurable. And then once we've got to root cause and we've come up with our countermeasures, we can ask ourselves, did we, kind of, did we kind of know what we were doing? And if not, why not? So looking at just that map before, we saw 90% of it was triangles. And what people kind of say is, well, let's go after half of them. Let's cut half of those weights. Each one of those triangles and subsystems on there is actually then investigated by the team, looking at why they happen. And generically, you, you, you find a number of deep causes in this. And actually, there's actually no visible plans for patients that actually go the entire journey of the patient. And it gets more and more complex by the number of offline services and departments and divisions that you go through. Just by looking at availability of services across the patch, you can actually see the hours don't line up. And because they don't line up, you're going to get waits, you're going to get queues. It's not even designed to make the thing work. You look at the staff, we're not even staffed to, to the actual budgets that we've put in place because of, of certain certain other initiatives that are going on and there's this myth that we think that we can cover with bank and agency or locum type staff that actually don't know the, the common rules in the place and we think that's cheaper but when you actually add it up it actually costs you more than the things you're trying to save <coughs> and this, this this last thing under here is is actual demand-based design of frequency of intervention is not the way that we've worked out our job plans and rosters
So, we've gone down the left side and, and we've held the leaders and the people into root cause analysis problems and really understanding things out of offices far longer than they traditionally would. And, and this is a really important point. But now, actually, what you've got to do is you've got to let them go. But before letting them go, we actually wanted to give them a few ideas or themes to shape the sort of countermeasures that the people are coming up with. Okay? And we, we sort of said well, there's, there's, there's four things, really, that, that, that we would like to kind of understand. And I'm just, I'm just going to go very quickly through those four sorts of ideas or things to say, well, do you know these things about your units, your hospitals? The notion of tack time or, or, you know, when things are available, when your service is available to access and actually how much demand is trying to get into that. You saw the picture before. Okay, so this is that you're looking at the numbers of demand that's coming in, but when your customers are outside a system, like in manufacturing, there is only one tack time. In health, there's actually more than one. So there's actually, if you look at it, there's a demand to get out, and there is a tack time to get out, because when you actually gather the information, you'll have 20 to 30% of your medical spaces are occupied by patients who are medically safe to be at another destination. 20 to 30%, day in, day out. But you can't see them. And if you can't see them, you can't do anything about them. So there's that idea of back-end demand rates to problem solve. And there's also demand rates at the front door. And what we actually try to pick up is that the short-term variations and differences between the two causes a lot of the problems. Okay? Everybody's quite, it's quite visible. You can see the front door. You can see the queues building in the, in the, in the major's corridors. You, you can see, like, everybody's attuned to that. But one of the things we notice is at, the, at, at, the, at, this, at this back end, there's a, there's a foot off the gas. Yeah? So, so it's almost like we're like coiled springs waiting to jump into action and discharge people or whatever else because we're keeping an eye on the front door. But the thing is, all our cycle times, all our times for getting ready and springing into action and doing something, they're all too slow. They're too slow for demand. And, and for me, working with these, these places, I was so much more happier when I knew that every 10 minutes there would be a trolley arriving in majors. Because I could put into context then, I could put into context my half-day board meeting. Because I knew every 10 minutes, patient is coming to majors, six minutes to minors. The within-day and within-week variations on these things could be worked out, and you can see what they are. But once you can start to see those things, you can actually begin to tailor the sort of capacity, the people, that you're going to need to put in place. So that was a big thing. Tack time is very important in a number of things because you actually want to synchronise things through the system. And again, this notion of offline services carving out bits of demand and thinking they've got their own tack times, it doesn't actually work like that. Because if under that they, they actually believe that they've got a lot longer than the patient demand to come in and demand to come out, queues are going to form. Second part is all about those triangles. We just want to talk about triangles in the first instance because that's stressing the staff, it's frustrating the people. As leaders, let's help them. And there's a number of activities there that are saying, and this example is at the front door, but, but Ken is going to talk about more this. And it's the idea that actually we can, we can actually remove the triangles. We can be sensible. And that idea at the bottom there is this, this idea, this notion of no triangles or flow is actually this idea of the human chain moving through it. And flow means all the patients are moving to the planned destination, not just random movements around where we have spaces. Because of the variation and because we can't 
immediately jump to this. We, we needed the single buffers and buffers to absorb variation and differences in processing time. And you actually have a lot of informal buffers through your system. But, but what's actually happened is there's no actual definition of why your buffers are there and, and I keeping an eye on how they're managed, how they run. So what we actually said is, is we need to be a lot clearer about sizing of buffers, location, operational management roles of buffers, and monitoring how they're happening. And that was built a lot around this thing of, you know, to go from a full bed with one patient in to an empty bed to a changeover to a space to accommodate someone else, the cycle times are too slow. You can't run your system when all your buffers are full. We're just not ready for that yet. But this notion of saying, hang on, I need empty spaces to be able to cope with these things because I'm too slow, you start seeing the accountants up in arms. You, 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 you know, as soon as they see a space, they'll cut it. And you've got to, got to really get rid of that behavior. But it's only the senior people can do that. That's just some blurb on, on the buffers. You, you, you can read that about ownership. Like. And this is this other one, these local departmental schedules and rules that are all set by division and for local efficiency, they create triangles. So what we're trying to say is if we can get rid of local schedules, end to end, this idea of a single, single unambiguous point where if we need to go quicker, it's clear for everybody we need to go quicker. If we need to go slower, we go slower. And we, we, we just sort of term that the, a pacemaker, and we liken it to um, an orchestra without a conductor. Yeah, the component parts are all very capable, but without that one point signaling the score, it's just noise. And one of the key points in that, of course, is to bear in mind is this demand rate, is that 10 minutes, six minutes, whatever it is in your case. This is kind of showing how a pacemaker would send work orders to the back door, to the wards, to actually create, at the beginning of every day, the movement. So things like, you know, only starting packages of care in the afternoon because we know we can't get, we can't get patients out of hospital in the morning. You've actually got to overcome that with your partners because they're doing that as a cost-saving measure. So it becomes a vicious circle because nurses then won't discharge early because they know they can't get packages of care till the afternoon. So everything is just held up. You know, the notion of um, outpatient pharmacy demands having top priority against inpatient TTOs, you've got to question that, that validity. Why can't you do both? Because all of those things mean you, you, you can't physically get the movement. So... These are the sort of things that we're trying to get with the leadership teams thinking and talking about to then engage their staff to join them. So rather than being stepped back and listened to and being the coach and facilitator that has no knowledge of the work, we actually want the leaders to actually become knowledgeable on the work. Not then to force solutions on the rest of the organisation, but to actually participate in the problem-solving approach together. So all of those things actually are interdependent and actually need to work together as a system. This is just drawing all the answers to those questions on a bit of paper. So if you notice, there's no triangles. It is, I promise you, it is the same process as the one that was in the earlier map. You know, we haven't, but you, I've just circled there where the buffers have had to be located, you know, the demand rate, where the pacemaker is going to work, and where the triangles have been removed to actually get coherent movement. And that's it, thrown in there. Now, that's my kind of scene setting for the rest of the talks and the guys who are going to talk to you all about the components or the actuals of doing that based on these approaches.